the Federalist Society. The Society was uh, formed by a lot of people just like you and I. Uh, we got three basic ideas and principles that we espouse. That uh, first, the state exists to preserve freedom. Second, that the Constitution uh, provides a separation of powers that is central to the governance of our country. And third, that it is emphatically the, the province of the judiciary to just say what the law is. Uh, today's presentation by uh, Mr. Levy um, probably will point out that, that sometimes uh, what the law is, according to the Supreme Court, may not be the best uh, uh, decision, but uh, I will leave that to uh, him and his uh, assessment. Uh, Mr. Levy, I'm going to actually put up on the bulletin board his uh, bio while he speaks. That way, as you guys uh, uh, have lunch and listen to him, his information will be up there, and I won't use up any more time. Um, thank you again for joining us for the Dirty Dozen. This is uh, Mr. Robert Lee from Cato Institute. Please join me in welcome. Well, it's, it's great to be with you. I'm going to talk about how the Supreme Court has uh, subverted the uh, Constitution. But before I uh, uh, point out a few of what I consider to be the worst cases, I want to set the stage with uh, a few comments on liberals and conservatives and how their views of the Constitution uh, differ from the libertarian views that are embraced by me and by my uh, uh, colleagues at the Cato Institute. Uh, now, when I speak about... Uh, Libertarians. I'm not talking about the libertarian political party. I'm talking about, I don't have to be against the libertarian political party, but I'm talking about libertarianism as a political philosophy that focuses on private property, free markets, individual liberty, and most of all, strictly uh, limited government. So at the Cato Institute, where I chair the board, uh, we do not uh, endorse candidates, we do not endorse parties, and as you're going to hear in just a minute, we're equally critical of both the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, indeed, uh, critical of liberals and conservatives. But we do have a consistent, I call it minimalist view about the proper role of government. So conservatives will agree with us on some issues. They tend to be uh, domestic, regulatory, tax, budget, fiscal type uh, issues. And liberals will agree with us on other issues. They tend to be the social issues, the non interventionist foreign policy, or the liberalized uh, immigration uh, policy. Now, how is it that Libertarians can agree with conservatives sometimes and liberals sometimes. Does that mean that libertarianism is internally, philosophically inconsistent? It doesn't mean that at all. As a matter of fact, what it means is that liberals and conservatives are inconsistent. And to illustrate that, I want to uh, suggest to you that the structure of our federal system, the structure of our Constitution, can be best captured by looking at the final two amendments uh, in the Bill of Rights. Thank you, thank you. For those of you who haven't had con law, the 10th Amendment tells us the federal government uh, can only exercise the powers enumerated in the Constitution. If you look in Article 1 or uh, Section 8, you'll see power to coin money, uh, the power to establish post offices, regulate interstate commerce, and a few others, about 18 of them. Uh, the 10th Amendment tells us that the powers that are not delegated to the federal government uh, and not enumerated in the Constitution are reserved to the states or depending on the provisions of state law reserved directly to the people. Conservatives and libertarians generally agree on that pretty tightly constrained view of federal power, but there are a couple of uh, key exceptions. One key exception in this powers of government area is that uh, conservatives, uh, but not libertarians, are willing to federalize. That is, assign responsibility to the federal government a significant amount of both criminal law and civil law. If you want an example in the criminal law area, take a look at that totally feckless war on drugs, for which there is no constitutional authority for the federal government to be involved. If you want an example in the civil law area, take a look at the conservative cries for malpractice reform in the current health care department. Now, malpractice reform may be a really good idea, maybe something that's long overdue. But the question for libertarians is where is malpractice reform authorized in the U.S. Constitution? The advocates say that it's a regulation of interstate commerce. If you know anything about a malpractice a transaction, it's typically an in-state in -state patient suing an in-state doctor for an injury that occurred uh, within one state. It's awful difficult to imagine a malpractice uh, transaction uh, morphing into uh, interstate, uh, interstate uh, commerce. The, the libertarians invoke a uh, slightly different principle, and that is that no matter how worthwhile the goal is, no matter how sure Congress is that it's identified a really big problem and knows precisely how to fix the problem, 
The real question is whether or not there is constitutional authority, and if there is none, then libertarians insist that the federal government step aside and leave the matter up to states, or better yet, leave it up to private parties. Of course, that's, that was the intent, but it's not what's happened over the years. Today, the federal government is immersed in uh, matters ranging from public schools to hurricane relief, welfare, retirement systems, uh, medical care, family planning, housing, AD arts, none of which is uh, constitutionally authorized in my view. A second area where libertarians and conservatives differ when it comes to powers of government is that conservatives are far less uh, concerned, far less anxious than libertarians about concentrating a heck of a lot of power in the executive branch of government, particularly in this post-9-11 trade-off between civil liberties and national security. Uh, libertarians remind their conservative friends that too much unchecked authority in the hands of the executive branch threatens this notion of separation of powers that's been a centerpiece of our Constitution for two and a quarter centuries. So that the administration, I mean most importantly the George W. Bush administration, uh, may not by itself unilaterally set the rules because that is not an executive function, it's a legislative function. And while the administration may prosecute infractions, it may not, after the fact, determine guilt or innocence. And it may not determine whether its own actions have comported with the dictates of the of the Constitution. So that's the powers of government perspective, uh, grounded on the Tenth Amendment and separation of powers doctrine. Now, I mentioned also the Ninth Amendment, as you, as you know, if you've taken common law, you may know anyway. Uh, the Ninth Amendment doesn't talk about powers. It talks about uh, rights, and what it says is that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shouldn't be read as denying that there are other rights that we, that we have. In fact, that we had before the Constitution was written, before the government was even uh, formed. And that safeguard imposes another very powerful discipline on federal behavior. Because what it means is this, that even if the federal government is exercising the powers that are set out in the Constitution in accordance with the Tenth Amendment, that is only exercising its enumerated powers, the Ninth Amendment instructs that even that limited list of powers may not be exercised in a manner which violates our rights. And if you want to know which rights can't be violated, the Ninth Amendment instructs that you look not just for the ones that are set out in the Bill of Rights, speech, religion, press, uh, unreasonable searches, etc., but also to the um, unbounded number, really, of unenumerated rights, which in the libertarian view would include the right to gamble, for example, or for that matter, of the right to smoke marijuana. Uh, now note that the presumptions underlying the Ninth and Tenth, tenth Amendments are exactly opposite one another. If you understand that, I think you've captured the whole uh, structure of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the Tenth Amendment says if the power isn't there, the government doesn't have it. The Ninth Amendment, just the reverse. Merely because the right isn't there doesn't mean we don't have it. We have a long list of rights that are not enumerated. So if you want to identify a single constitutional provision that separates uh, libertarians from uh, from conservatives, it would be the Ninth Amendment. Uh, the conservatives treat the Ninth Amendment as, a, and this is uh, former Judge Robert Porch, remember the term, an ink blot. He said the Ninth Amendment should be ignored. Nobody knows what it means. It's as if somebody spilled ink on the portion of the Ninth Amendment that would have identified <coughs> these unenumerated rights that the uh, libertarians uh, uh, insist that, uh, uh, that we have. Uh, the libertarians treat the Ninth Amendment as if it uh, as if it means something. Uh, specifically, it refers to our natural rights, the rights that we had uh, by nature, pre-government, and that we still retain. <clears throat> like the member even said, retain. You can't retain what you didn't already have. So what kind of rights are these? In short, these are all of the so-called negative rights. It sounds like a pejorative term, but it's not meant to be. It simply means a right that the exercise of which doesn't impose affirmative obligations on anybody else other than the obligation to leave me alone. Don't exercise force or fraud against me. As contrasted with a positive right, the exercise of which would impose affirmative obligations on other people. So let me see if I can flesh that out a little bit. Uh, let's talk about the right to the pursuit of happiness. That's a negative right. I can pursue happiness. I do not need your help. Just stay out of my way. Again, don't exercise force or fraud against me. Other than that, you have no affirmative obligation to help me pursue happiness. Suppose, however, I had a right to happiness, as contrasted with the pursuit of happiness. That is, I have a right to the attainment, the achievement, the realization of a happy state. And, of course, if I say I have a right, that presupposes I have a remedy. I can do something about it if the right's violated. Because if you have a right and no remedy, then that's just if you didn't have a right at all. And so if I have an enforceable right to happiness, you can imagine 
that that would impose an affirmative obligation on each and every one of you. Uh, at a minimum, you wouldn't be able to do anything that would make me unhappy. And if you did, uh, I would be able to gain, uh, to, uh, to get a redress uh, for that. And that, of course, would restrict your own pursuit of happiness. So the right to happiness is a positive right. The right to the pursuit of happiness is a negative right. The positive rights that we ordinarily deal with uh, are not these abstract rights like the pursuit of happiness, but something concrete like welfare, minimum wage, uh, health care, uh, education, uh, housing. Um, and these are integral, of course, to the liberal view of the proper role of government. Since I've been a critic of the conservatives, I want to be an equal opportunity uh, uh, critic. Uh, liberals, of course, embrace big government. But why do they embrace big government? Uh, well, one reason is because they embrace positive rights. So positive rights of, of impose affirmative obligation on, on, on folks that have to put up the things to which some folks have a right. Uh, so. When you have to put up housing, if somebody has an enforceable right to housing, somebody somewhere has to provide a house or the means by which the house can be, can be acquired, typically through the tax system. Well, occasionally the people have to furnish the benefits that don't go along with the program. And uh, the government, which is the only entity in our system that's authorized to use force, steps in and coerces uh, conformance with the program. And that's why liberals need big government, because they want to enforce um, Positive, uh, positive rights. Now, it's, it's I think, uh, interesting in this post-9-11 environment that in liberals ordinary distrust, uh, ordinary trust for big government uh, is reflected in a distrust for big government in one particular area. And again, that's this trade-off between national security uh, and civil liberties. Now, I think that's a healthy distrust to distrust big government when it comes to civil liberties. But one wonders, where does the left stand on other areas where government exercises enormous control over our lives, like control over our retirement system, our welfare system, our public school system, uh, the private economy? Why hasn't the left's healthy distrust of, of government in the civil liberties area extended to things like support for privatized social security or school choice, or the elimination of regulations that seem to control everything from the size of the naval arms to, uh, to the uh, ergonomics of, uh, of office equipment? Why is it that liberals can't see past two particular agencies of government when they're worried about big government? All the other agencies can get as big as they wish, and liberals like that. But two agencies, the Defense Department and the Justice Department, that gives liberals uh, some concern. And oddly enough, those two agencies are the two agencies that are indisputably charged with a legitimate function of government, namely to protect us against domestic and, uh, and foreign Predators. So, you know, imagine if the Congress were to delegate to the Justice Department, particularly if it was still under Ashcroft and Gonzalez, uh, the job of uh, setting rules that, that govern the trade-off between national security and civil liberties. And liberals would be apoplectic, and they'd have every right to be, because it's not the job of the Justice Department to be establishing rules. But when the same Congress delegates to the Environmental Protection Agency, the power to establish rules over the trade-off between a clean environment and economic growth, and it gives the EPA no more guidance than keep us safe from the pollutants. Uh, folks on the left applaud enthusiastically. Now, could it be that pollutants are a greater threat than terrorists? Not likely. And what is likely is that liberals have a selective indignation uh, about big government. And that reflects, I think, an inconsistency in the liberal mindset, just as there is an inconsistency in the conservative mindset about uh, that proper role. Of course, that's the foundational <coughs> question. What is the proper role of government? And I think that uh, in assessing that, examining that question, uh, you can look at this Constitution through these two prisms. The powers of government prism, which is the Tenth Amendment, the rights of individuals prism, which is the Ninth Amendment. And if you want the uh, uh, libertarian view in a nutshell, it is that we view the powers of government very narrow, and we view the rights of individuals uh, very broadly, and that uh, we would have is precisely the vision of the framers. So, now that I've uh, offended everyone, <laughs> uh, let me turn to a couple of these uh, cases with this uh, short preface. Uh, it's been uh, 217, uh, 220 years uh, since the Bill of Rights ratified, and, and since that time, and the Constitution has only been amended 17 times. How come so few changes? Because the framers couldn't have imagined uh, the uh, 21st century, uh, what it would look like. I think there are lots of reasons, three of which are especially important in the context of this talk. 
two of the reasons are good ones, one's not so good. The first good reason uh, is that um, the frame, the, the your Constitution was an incredibly well-crafted document written by uh, uh, geniuses, and they had a vision of liberty every bit as relevant today as it was back then. Uh, secondly, in the exercise of their genius, they had the foresight to structure Article 5 and made it very difficult to amend the Constitution. You have to have two-thirds of the House and Senate proposed amendments have to be ratified by three-fourths of the state. Uh, not surprisingly, that's, that's tough to do. Not surprisingly, it's, uh, it's uh, only happened a few times, 17 since the Bill of Rights. And the result is that we have a very stable constitutional framework as a result. Now, there is this, I think, bad reason that we haven't had so many amendments, and that is that the Supreme Court has uh, accomplished through the back door what the Congress and the states uh, could not have accomplished if they followed the prescribed amendment uh, process. Uh, the, uh, the modern court, I think, has uh, more than occasionally lost its compass, and that has uh, implications for all of us. So let me talk about a few of the cases that I think are most egregious, some of which, if you've had con law, you may have studied. If you've had con law, you may not have studied one or two of these cases, too. In any event, this first case is about the general welfare clause. It's, about, it's called Helfring v. Davis, um, and this was a 1937 uh, case. The issue in the case was whether or not the Social Security system is constitutional, so you see it has relevance in the context of today's health care today. Now, again, you have to think like a judge. This is not whether Social Security is a good idea. It's not whether it's actually really sound. It's not whether guys like me, who's 70 years old, like getting our, our Social Security checks. It's not that at all. The question is, where in the Constitution is the Social Security system authorized? And if you ask uh, the proponents, they point to the General Welfare Clause, which is the, the power to tax in order to provide uh, for the general welfare. And this became a battle between uh, Hamilton and uh, Madison. Uh, Hamilton said that the General Welfare Clause is a power over and above all of the other powers that are set out in Article I, Section 8. It's an additional power. Not only can Congress regulate commerce and establish post offices and coin money, whatever, but it can also tax in order to provide for the general welfare. Uh, Madison said that can't be the case. Because if that's the case, just about everything can be positive as providing for the general welfare. We end up with a government of unbounded powers when we know what we intended to uh, implement was a government of limited powers. And Madison even went a step further. He said not only is the general welfare clause an extra added power, it's actually a limitation on Congress's power. What Madison thought was that the general welfare clause required that Congress, in exercising its other enumerated powers, had to jump through one more hoop. It could only exercise those other powers in a manner that promote, promoted the general welfare and not the welfare of what Madison called factions and what we today call uh, the special interests. Well, the Supreme Court uh, took a look at this in Helbert v. Davis, 1937, and uh, long story short, Hamilton wins, Madison uh, loses. And so the Social Security system is indeed constitutional, according to the court, a distinction between the Constitution and constitutional law is interpreted by the Supreme Court. And, and as a result, um, the federal government can compel everybody to provide for their own retirement. That opened the floodgates through which uh, the redistributive state was ready to pour, taking money from some people and giving it to other people uh, without any meaningful uh, constitutional constraints. And the General Welfare Clause is one of two major clauses that are being cited now um, in the context of the debate over the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which some people call Obamacare. I know you have a debate on this uh, with my colleague, uh, William Shapiro, not too long ago. Uh, the other clause, by the way, that's being used for the, uh, to assert the constitutionality of uh, PPACA is the Commerce Clause. And the key case there is Wicker v. Filburn, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, 1942 case. And the, and the question in that case was whether the Congress's power, undisputed power, says so in Article I, Section 8, to regulate interstate commerce, does it include activities that are not interstate and not commerce? Now, if you think the answer to that is self-evident no, then, of course, you haven't been following uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, Filburn grows wheat on his own farm. He doesn't buy the wheat. He grows it. Uh, he doesn't sell any of the wheat in interstate commerce. In fact, most of it he eats or he gives to his farm animals. And the Roosevelt administration, uh, during the Depression, decides that the price of farm products is too low and has to be buttressed. How do you buttress the price? Well, you, you kind of 101, cut supply. 
So Roosevelt says to Filburn, you've got to stop producing so much. Filburn says, under what authority? And Roosevelt says, regulation of interstate commerce. Uh, Filburn sensibly replies, well, guess what? It's not interstate. Uh, there, it's all on my farm, all within one state, and there's no commerce. I'm buying this stuff, and then I'm eating what I grow. And the <coughs> court uh, examined this and basically said, Filburn, you just don't get it. Uh, if you weren't out there growing this stuff, you would have had to buy it. And if you weren't eating everything you grew, you would have had left over some to sell, some of which would have gone into the interstate market. So by not buying and not selling, uh, you and all the others taken in the aggregate who are doing the same sort of thing uh, have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. <coughs> that opened a second set of floodgates, the regulatory state, regulating anything and everything under the rubric uh, of the Commerce Clause. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, that uh, case, Worker B. Filburn, paved the way for this, uh, what I consider to be a noxious notion that Congress can even punish the failure for you to buy a private product from a private company, namely health insurance. Um, under current law, by the way, you know it's illegal to buy health insurance across state lines. And so there is no interstate market to be regulated. Um, and there's no commerce if you don't buy something. This individual mandate to extend the dominion of the federal government to virtually all manner of conduct, including non conduct And that's uh, the legacy of working to be built. Uh, a third case, uh, which also has current uh, implications in light of the financial crisis, is a case called Home Building and Loan Association uh, versus Blasdale, 1934 case. It's about the contract clause. The contract clause is really pretty crystal. It says, quote, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of, con of contracts. I mean, I can't imagine why that's difficult to interpret. The Supreme Court <laughs> had a tough time. And in fact, the court upheld a Minnesota statute that, and see if this sounds familiar, uh, postponed mortgage payments for financially troubled homeowners. Uh, never mind the contract. Uh, and of course, we're seeing a replay of that now, as creditors are, are pressured to waive foreclosure on subprime and other mortgages. Now, we're not just talking about contracts that were fraudulently induced. They were fraudulently induced. They're not enforceable. There are plenty of laws on the books to govern. We're not talking about uh, foreclosures that take place without uh, proper uh, paperwork. Uh, again, there are already laws on the books. What we're talking about is uh, mortgages extended to home buyers who understood the risks involved uh, and, uh, and foreclosures that were properly documented. And nonetheless, there is governmental pressure to uh, give up uh, foreclosure laws. The legacy, again, of Home Run Building Association versus Blasley. Uh, fourth case um, is about, again, the implications for today's financial crisis, about what's called the non-delegation doctrine. Frequently, even folks in law school who study common law, they study the non-delegation doctrine, in part because the Supreme Court has pretty much made it a moribund doc uh, doc doctrine. The very first sentence in the Constitution, right after the preamble, says all legislative power is vested in Congress. <clears throat> Why? Because the framers, again, were very smart guys. And they knew if Congress passes an oppressive law, then the voters can respond by throwing the bums out of office. Uh, the, the problem, however, is that Congress often passes laws and nobody knows what they mean. And then Congress delegates to one of the 320 alphabet agencies in Washington, D.C., administrative agencies, not part of the legislative branch, uh, the power to flesh out the details, fill in the blanks that Congress uh, has left. Uh, well, the courts uh, are not doing much about that impermissible delegation, and the voters can't do much about it because these cabinet departments and administrative agencies, uh, they're not run by elected uh, representatives, they're run by unelected bureaucrats. And if you like this delegation of uh, legislative authority to unelected bureaucrats, then and even though it's prohibited by the Constitution, then you will love TARP, uh, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which turns U.S. lawmaking power essentially over to the Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, and then his successor, uh, Timothy Guyton. Uh, Paulson first decides, without any congressional guidance at all, to purchase toxic assets from banks that uh, were deemed to be too big to fail. And then within a few weeks, he changed his mind, again, without any input from Congress, and decided, uh, no, we're not going to purchase toxic assets. We're going to have a direct injection of capital into these banks. And along comes Geithner, and he changed the rules again. He decided what we needed is a public-private partnership, by which he meant the private banks get all the money 
and the public, that is us, the taxpayers, uh, we pay uh, all the costs. Of course, along the way, the administration expropriates $180 billion to bail out the insurance giant uh, AIG and a few tens of billions of dollars to bail out the automobile companies, despite Congress's express rejection of automobile bailout legislation. And what have the courts said about this? Well, we know that uh, the Constitution says you're not supposed to do this, but governing is pretty complicated. And so we're going to make an exception. We need the help of these 320 agencies. Delegation to these administrative agencies of legislative power is going to be okay as long as Congress lays down an intelligible principle so that the agencies know how to uh, fill in uh, the gaps. Well, what was the intelligible principle that Paulson and Geiger uh, had to follow? Nobody knows. Uh, least of all, the taxpayers that have to foot the bill. Uh, make things better uh, seem to be the principle, and that is hardly a coherent guide uh, to conduct. Last case, uh, because we have a short time frame here, last case that I'm going to cover is uh, a case that's gotten quite a lot of publicity. Um, two cases, actually. The first of which was called McConnell versus Federal Election Commission, and the second of which is Citizens United, the more recent case. Uh, the Citizens United case reversed in part. The McConnell case, this is all about campaign finance and free speech. The campaign finance reformers, they had this quixotic idea that the money and elections shouldn't mix, and so they passed McCain-Feingold in 2002, and we know how well that worked out, right? Uh, we had the 2008 election six years after McCain-Feingold, and during that election, more money was spent than in any election in the history of, of the universe. Um, McCain-Feingold ultimately was codified as BICRA, BCRA, the bipartisan. A campaign Reform Act, and then the Supreme Court, I think, inexplicably upheld BICRA in McConnell versus FEC uh, 2003 case, a year after BICRA was passed, and that's McConnell, as in Rich McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader from Kentucky. Uh, the court in that case, McConnell v. FEC, decided that political expression, if there's anything that the First Amendment was intended to protect, it's political expression. The court decided that political expression gets less First Amendment protection than Klan speech. <clears throat> and pornography and flag burning, all of those are, and I think ought to be, uh, protected under the First Amendment, but some forms of political expression are not constitutionally protected under McCain-Feingold uh, called Big uh, For example, if a publishing company, let's say Random House, a major publishing company, any publishing company, uh, corporation, published a book, and somewhere within the 600 pages or so of the book were three words, vote for Obama, or vote against Obama that book would have been illegal and could be barred. Well, we're not supposed to be about any books uh, in the United States, and that's why the court decided to take another look at this whole issue, and they did so in the Citizens United uh, case. Uh, Citizens United, the FEC, came down in January of last year, and the court overturned McCain-Feingold's two, two of uh, the worst restrictions on corporate and union political expression. The one was, the one I just mentioned, no corporation or labor union can publish anything that expressly advocates uh, the uh, election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate. The second provision that was overturned of, of McCain-Feingold is that no broadcast ad funded by a corporation or labor union can even name a candidate. You don't have to say vote for or vote against. You cannot even name a candidate within 60 days of an election general election or 30 days of a, uh, of a, uh, a primary. Uh, that case, Citizens United, was about a movie called Hillary the Movie. And under the rules, it was critical of, of candidate, then candidate Hillary Clinton. Uh, under the rules, it was okay to show the movies in theaters. It was okay to sell the movie on DVD, but you couldn't advertise that the movie was available to be seen in the theaters. And you couldn't advertise that the DVD, DVD was available for sale, nor could you make the movie available over cable because that was considered to be a broadcast of distribution. 5-4 decision written by Justice Kennedy, uh, and he, I think, correctly recognized, among other things, corporations and labor unions, this is not one monolithic block of money that comes in on one side or another. Corporations typically favor things that labor unions oppose, and as a matter of fact, even within the corporate community, you get a company like Walmart that was uh, very much in favor of, of Obama's health care plan. Uh, you get a company like uh, Whole Foods that was uh, very much uh, opposed to it. 
And by the way, the issue in this case is not whether corporations are persons. That's what the media played up the case to be. The issue is not that at all. That's a very interesting issue about which there's a great deal of legal scholarship. It wasn't the issue in this case. The issue in this case is whether individuals are free to associate and pull their resources to express themselves <coughs> about political candidates as they wish, whether they do so individually or through a club or an organization or a partnership or an LLC or a corporation or a labor union. Uh, and by the way, another thing that the media has misrepresented, that under the new rules, even after Citizens United, corporations <coughs> and labor unions may not contribute a dime to political candidates, federal political candidates. It's illegal. What they can do is they can publish ads, and those ads can be broadcast without the restrictions that existed under mccain Feingold. Now, if, if money is still a problem, if we perceive that money leads to, to, uh, to uh, uh, too much political influence, then the proper answer, I think, is more, more speech, more money. Uh, get more views on the other side of the uh, equation. And if that still doesn't work, uh, then, uh, then a constitutional amendment. We can't treat the First Amendment like it's just so much tissue paper. Uh, as for money, my, my thought is that it's, it's simply a symptom of the problem. The real problem is overweening government that sort of wormed its way into every aspect of our lives. And we have this pervasive regulatory and redistributive state creates huge incentives for profiteering. It's no wonder lobbyists are going running to Washington, D.C. to seek favors. It's because there are so many favors there to be doled out. So if you want to, if there's a big money problem, it's because there's a big government problem. Uh, you cut government down to size and you can minimize the influence of, uh, of big money. That means, of course, restoring the framework notion of enumerated, uh, delegated, and, and uh, limited uh, federal powers, and that will get government out of our <coughs> lives and, uh, and out, of our, out of our wallets. So I think in a free society, we shouldn't have to ask for uh, government permission to participate in elections. We shouldn't be forced to buy health insurance or bail out the car companies. Uh, but those abuses of power can be minimized only if Congress, uh, I'm sorry, if the court ensures uh, that the legislative and the executive branches are bound by the chains uh, of the Constitution. And regrettably, the Supreme Court has been, uh, <coughs> again, more than occasionally, derelict in uh, fulfilling that obligation. And I think it's time to restore uh, constitutional government. Thanks very much. Uh, following with comment, uh, our own professor uh, Weising, uh, uh, he is required to put his bio up on the board, but uh, it, is, it is available on the Syracuse homepage, and, and uh, again, please welcome Professor Weising. Thank you very much. I have ten minutes to speak, and I'll observe that limit strictly. I had no idea what Mr. Levy was going to be talking about before he came here, and I discovered that his first 15 minutes, the preface as he calls it, I completely preempted everything I had to say, or almost everything. Uh, so a lesson for law students there, when you are going to be making an argument, always have a backup. Uh, and fortunately I came with a backup. But I do want to say a little bit about, about Mr. Levy's first point, which is the relationship among liberals, libertarians, and conservatives. I, uh, I don't have much to add about his, his uh, comments about the relationship between libertarians and conservatives, except to point out that these things can be best uh, illustrated visually by a pair of Venn diagrams. So that, for example, here, I'll use blue to designate libertarians. Um, a libertarian position on most ideological and governmental programs looks something like that, I think. I will let that, re that circle represent the libertarian position. The conservative position, if you map the conservative position on it, is largely overlapping, so that the, in the large area in the middle, their conservative and libertarian positions, ideologically and politically, tend to reflect each other. It's only in marginal areas around the edges that they would disagree. And I point out that the Federalist Society identifies itself primarily as a conservative, although it also claims to be a libertarian society, whereas Mr. Levy's Institute, uh, uh, Cato Institute is purely a libertarian organization. Um, the, um, the areas, however, where, uh, and he's, Mr. Levy's pointed out the areas in, in which um, <coughs> this, uh, uh, the, uh, correction, this uh, part of the Venn diagram uh, 
would be filled in, such things as federalization of the criminal law, federalization of civil law, and the practice reform, executive power, and national security, and the Ninth Amendment. If you were to diagram a comparable uh, representation of the difference between libertarians and liberals, on the other hand, the picture would look something like this. Uh, again, blue represents the uh, libertarian position. Green here will represent the liberal position, which I will presumably speak for here. And we have our area of overlap is a lot smaller. But I would like to talk for two or three minutes about this area of overlap here, because um, I think Mr. Levy's representation of liberal position slights or ignores the extent to which those of us to the left of the political medium have considerable disagreement with libertarians. I would identify it as these. We are, first of all, skeptical of government. Certainly libertarians are. We deeply believe in individual liberty, again, a libertarian position. We have a deep and profound respect for the Constitution and its values. Um, we do believe, as a part of that, that one ought to interpret the Constitution according to its text and according to the known intentions of the framers. We call for judicial restraint, and we are critical of the United States Supreme Court. And above all, on a point that Mr. Levy did not mention, but I'm sure he agrees with, we are deeply dedicated to the, to the principle of Republican government. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. And so that would represent that little green hashed area there of areas where I'm sure we are all together on the same page. The difference is, in the, of course, in the actual application of those principles. Now, Mr. Levy used some phrases that I thought were perfectly descriptive, at least of me and probably a lot of other liberals, where, where he spoke of, if I can learn, uh, if he, where he spoke, he says that we are um, in favor of a pervasive regulatory and re redistributive state. Yep, yeah, that's, that's me, check. Um, where is the left critical of the federal government? He cites re retirement, welfare, public schools, regulation, uh, and says that we do applaud the EPA enthusiastically. Yes, I do. If the EPA's only short shortcoming is it doesn't go far enough. And he says that we liberals have a selective indignation about the government's role. That's true, but it's equally true on that side. That is to say, my selective indignation is this unshaded part of the Venn diagram, but Mr. Levy's selective indignation is on the blue shade, blue part of the unshaded part of the diagram. Anyway, so much by way of comparisons for liberals, conservatives, and libertarians. Um, but Mr. Levy said all that needs to be said about that, and there's nothing more for me to say there, so I'd instead like to use what little five minutes I have left to talk about two other things that, that um, uh, are, are really interesting and, uh, in, the, in, the, in the circumstance of a libertarian's appearance here. The first is that, uh, as Linda Greenhouse not, uh, alerted us about a week ago in one of her wonderful columns in the New York Times, the uh, conservatives and liberals, uh, libertarians today have become enamored of something that they call uh, judicial engagement. And it so happens that Mr. Levy's book, by coincidence, not by coincidence actually, um, does in fact devote a few pages to that topic on page 222. He talks about the need for judicial engagement. Well, what that's all about is that conservatives have for a long time, and here I'll speak for conservatives, not libertarians, conservatives have for a long time been critical of something called judicial activism. And judicial activism has been, uh, that's a conservative mantra. Uh, it, uh, the, the mantra is that uh, judges substitute their personal values for those of the written constitution. And there is a Scalia variant of that part of the mantra that says that it's elite judges who substitute class values for popular will. Um, the part of the, the conservatives claim that the uh, federal courts, meaning basically the uh, war in court in the years of liberal activism, um, uh, have ignored the original intent of the, of the Constitution. Uh, conservatives call for it for adopting strict construction. And as, as uh, John, Judge John Roberts said at his confirmation hearings for Chief Justice of the United States, the judges should do nothing more than call balls and strikes. Forgetting that one of the greatest American League 
baseball umpires of all time, when asked how he determines what's a ball and a strike, says, it ain't nothing until I call it. And that is just as true of judges as it is of baseball umpires. When that ball comes over the plate, it ain't a ball and it ain't a strike until the umpire calls it, and that basically is the function of the judiciary. But anyway, it, it seems to us on the left that conservatives have discovered the joys of judicial activism lately in the past 10 years, and suddenly they find themselves embarrassed by, um, uh, by something that they, by, by favoring now, something that they have been condemning articulately ever since Richard Nixon's time, which is the appointment of liberal judges who support this who impose their own personal values in place of the Constitution. So, to leave some room for judicial involvement, because obviously if Mr. Levy's pro promoted anything this afternoon, it is judicial activism. He could criticize the courts for not being activist enough. The, um, the conservative slash libertarian position now calls for judicial engagement uh, along the lines that Mr. Levy suggested. My last point, two minutes left, is I'd like to mention something that being a legal historian, a constitutional historian, is of huge interest to me. In fact, it forms a big part of the chapter of something I'm working on right now, and that is the, the capture of the grand narrative. Um, since the 1970s, conservatives and libertarians have, uh, through dint of enormous effort and hard work, have captured the narrative. Uh, the narrative of the place of the United States Supreme Court in American society, the narrative of what America is all about. I'd like to mention the grand narrative that we liberals previously dominated uh, that is um, no longer dominant, um, which is that since the Gilded Age, since the late 19th century, um, the Supreme Court was dominated by judicial conservatives who frustrated state and federal regulatory authority, that came to a head in the ongoing constitutional crisis of the 1930s. It was resolved by the failure of President FDR's court packing plan and by the United States Supreme Court's turning a 180-degree U-turn ideologically, um, reorienting judicial activism in a case that Mr. Levy explicitly and firmly condemns in his book, but that he did not mention in his discussion, the Carolyn Products case. Uh, and by the adoption of judicial self-restraint, although selective judicial self-restraint, judicial self-restraint directed at state and federal economic regulation. Uh, that was, with that new orientation, we had the glory days of Warren Hart liberal <coughs> activism from 1954 to 1970, and since 1970, we have entered a period of declension as the court has once again turned in a uh, conservative direction. That's the liberal vision the conservative vision is pretty much that spoken for by Mr. Levy. Um, you can uh, fill in the blanks on, on how the, the conservative slash libertarian vision differs from the traditional liberal, liberal vision. But that is, at any rate, the, these days conservatives dominate the basic assumptions about the way that our society ought to be operating. A few minutes. If there are uh, any questions for uh, either of our uh, panelists, yes, sir. Is that like ask Professor Levy, what definition of judicial activism do you think would apply to you? Judicial activism is when the judge substitutes his own policy preferences for the dictation of the Constitution. And how does that apply to you? The, the, other gentlemen just saying we're, that we're, we've advocated. I've advocated. I advocated the book. Uh, Libertarians generally advocate judicial engagement, which means a respect for the text of the Constitution and the willingness to overturn any any uh, legislative or executive enactment that uh, violates uh, the Constitution as its words would lead us to believe it should be interpreted. It sounds to me like that's undoing prior activism, not being activist. But it could be undoing prior activism. Certainly. Supreme Court uh, establishes rights that are non-existent, uh, then it's the, it's the libertarian uh, position that uh, those, those cases ought to be overturned. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Please, uh